Hey nerd fam, I'm Alina. But yet we are still two nerds and their pod with guest. Yeah, unfortunately Daniel wasn't feeling very well, so I'm uh, as last time I'm Ian, also known as Wyvarian. We are joined by uh, Josh, aka Vincent Elwin. Yay! So on this special episode, we're actually going to be talking about tabletop role-playing games. Uh, so I did notice that quite a few of my friends and even some co-workers and people that I've met, they have they know what Dungeons & Dragons is. They've heard of it. They've seen jokes about it in sitcoms or in TV series like Stranger Things. So I definitely feel like there is quite a bit of curiosity and more of an interest nowadays with our with our generation and the newer generation. But uh, there is a bit of a fear of how and when to start a tabletop role-playing group. So uh, Vince, a.k.a. Josh, or the other way around, Josh, a.k.a. Vince. <laughs> mm -hmm. So how long have you been playing tabletop role-playing games? Uh, well... My initial exposure was, uh, I think I was like 14, 15, something like that. And then I really got into it about five years ago, I'd say. Okay. And then I know, Ian, you've been, obviously you've DM'd. Uh, how long? Officially, for D&D &D type stuff, it's been 10, 11 years, I want to say, maybe 12. Uh, before then, like in like middle school and high school, I ran these weird little RPG games that didn't really have a rule system other than stuff I just created in my head at that very moment. But for like actual D&D, &D, yeah, it's been about 12 years at most. All right, so... As you can see, we have two kind of, I guess you could say, veterans when it comes to tabletop gaming, especially when it comes to DMing, because I've been playing tabletop role-playing games. Like, I've played Dungeons & Dragons. That was the first one I played. I did Pathfinder, and then I did, most recently, um, Chronicles of Darkness. However, there is a little bit of a difference between playing the game and then DMing the game i do feel like <laughs> you're in like in a hot seat when you're dming like everybody's staring at you and you're just kind of sitting there like okay now i have to create this world and these characters and i have to make it fun and adventurous and oh dear like even just thinking about it i'm getting kind of like <laughs> anxiety <laughs> get over that you do <laughs> yeah well i i would i would say a healthy amount of I guess not anxiety, but a healthy amount of, of concern is always good to hang on to because uh, it keeps you, you, you kind of realize what were you worried about and then sort of what to focus on. Okay. So then do you guys recall your first DM experience? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, so basically... The reason I say about five years ago was when I started D&D was because I had uh, I had just haphazardly joined an online tabletop group. And they were running Minds of Fendel from Minds of Fendalen, Fendelver. Uh, it's one of the other. It's like Fendalen is the name of the town or the fan, the name of the mines is Fen, Fen, Fendelver. Gosh. Um, <laughs> uh, fantasy names. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's it's the starter kit. It, it was the D and D starter kit, and I thought, ooh, this is how I'll get to learn how to play Dungeons and Dragons. So I played the uh, the dwarf cleric that came with the the build because I thought, well, every party needs a healer. Um, and then I I looked at it. And I was looking at the stats, and it, it it didn't really work that well because the the stats for that for that book are actually kind of bad. Uh, oh I think the, the people who developed the, the character kind of meant for, for late game growth, but they made an early game build. Like they should have made something a little bit earlier. 
uh, built with that in mind. Uh, but I ran with it, and mm-hmm. uh, <clears throat> I went in there. We had our session. We get back to the village, and the GM is trying to kind of stir up some conversation in a tavern, trying to go just a little off script to experiment, being a GM. Uh, and I just I just kind of ran with the role playing. Um, I was doing like all kind of motivational speeches to the tavern because the uh, the book says that the townsfolk are distraught because there's like bandits around or or something to that effect. And I just kind of I ran with it. And <laughs> like the next day, uh, that was my first ever session. And then the next day, the GM's like, "Hey, would you want to try GMing?" <laughs> And I've never been a player ever since. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> that was the start of a very long and permanent career. <laughs> permanent. Yeah, very permanent. Uh, the, the joke is, and I've never been a player since. Um, but there is, there is a little ring of truth to that. Like, once, once you have GM'd, you never go back to just being a player. Ever. Mm-hmm. Like, you can fit in a player seat. Mm-hmm. You can be a player. You can play in a, a, as... But, but really, you're more of a guest GM in a mm. lot of tables, I've found. So it's kind of like being a worker, being promoted to management, and then all of a sudden, okay, you're going to go back to just being a normal worker now, and you're just like, hmm. Your, your view is different <laughs> after that point. <laughs> Yeah, you you put in a year as a as a site as a supervisor to something, and then you go and you join another team, and for whatever reason, and you're an employee instead of the supervisor. Yeah, it it can mess with you. <laughs> it can. You're looking at it, and you're just like, mm, I wouldn't have done it that way. <laughs> I would have done that a little different. <laughs> all right, all right, and then Ian. I, I know you've spoken about your first time DMing, but for the audience, <laughs> how was your first DMing experience? It was actually in college. Um, I was just hanging out with some friends late night. We were at a pizza shop, and uh, he mentioned, oh, I would like to play D&D. And I was like, yeah, I would like to play D&D too, maybe even, you know, DM first mistake i had to the rule book yet that's another issue though and then literally two days later he was just like so when are we getting together for D and i'm just like uh, i didn't actually expect him to follow up on it you know i figured it was just going to be one of those things oh hey we should do this never does it uh i had i gave I gave myself a week to learn the rules, get a story together, and get players together. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> so then, I guess your mistake was to say, yeah, I guess I wouldn't mind trying to DM. <laughs> oh, no. And, and then kind of, like Vin said, never been a player. <laughs> Just, it's mm. not allowed. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, you, you can join someone's game. That's That's fine. But it it is nigh impossible to, to turn around and then uh, to just go back to being a player because you'll hear the GM and you'll be like, oh, I know where they're going with this. And that that is almost a curse. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> you see all before yeah. the players do. <laughs> yeah, once, once that curtain has been pulled at, back, Oz just never looks the same. I, I DM'd twice uh my first ever first dm was horrendous it was a horrible experience for me and it's because i had a very very in in comparison i had somebody but i was very creative was a dm and an experienced player in comparison to me first time DMing and a first time player during that time too. So while I was trying to build this, uh, I guess pre-written storyline, uh, Ian was just kind of having a little too much fun with it. <laughs> so Ian it tends to be very creative. He is just, he comes up with ideas i'll call them ideas yes he comes up with ideas that seem fun that seem great and then can totally throw off a dm because you're just like 
I, I didn't expect you guys to use one of the most important uh, NPCs to fish for Turosks. Like, that's not... <laughs> That was, I thought of a million other things that my players could do. Never did I think of that one, <laughs> that one thing. I, it just didn't occur to me. So that was a very horrendous part. But um, in my, not my defense, but I wasn't actually prepared either. I wasn't preparing myself. I was in like reading the rules and, you know, getting myself more familiar with the game. I was just kind of like, oh, it should be pretty easy. You know, I, I don't really need to do much preparing. And then, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that I, I learned very quick that, no, you need a lot of preparation when you're going to play, especially with experienced players. So when you guys were DMing, did you guys have any experienced uh, players versus your experience with DMing? Uh, I personally... Uh, I did. Um, I had a college mate named Mitch, and he'd been playing since, I think, second edition. So I deliberately went out and asked him to join just so I did have that veteran player there to give me feedback. And also, everybody else in my group was brand new to D&D as well. So I felt like I needed to bring in that veteran player to sort of teach everybody else as well because I was learning at the same time I couldn't you know, part of being a DM especially when you have new players is helping them grasp the rules grasp the system you're using mm. I didn't even have system mastery at that time I couldn't expect myself to be able to teach so I did kind of lean on him as a veteran player to help teach the others and teach myself mm -hmm. like the very first thing I did was he was playing a rogue so I had like a little thieves guild and I had one of the random NPCs I had um, attack him just so I could learn combat and show combat to everybody else. So uh, sometimes a veteran player, at least in my experience, was very, very necessary. Otherwise, I don't know if that group would have stayed together, honestly. That's true. It, he served as like a leader, a ringleader, I guess, so to speak. All right. Uh, Vince, when you had yours, did you have any veteran players, or were you all, like, <laughs> fresh? <laughs> I thought I had a veteran player or two. Oh, dear. Uh, on our team. Uh, they, they, certainly, they certainly knew more than me, um, but, the, but they had only been DMing, like, a week. Uh, <laughs> joined. I had joined shortly after their couple of session zeros where they had practiced everything so uh yeah they they were like all right well let's see what you got so about a month later i put together a story based off of uh, based off of city of heroes guild that i was a part of where oh. the, the party arrived by boat and then it, it was supposed to be kind of um do you understand the, the, the most wanted list, the deck of 52? No. No? Uh, vaguely. Like, if you ever played the Mercenaries game or just worked in the military at all, um, it's, it's just basically, like, most wanted targets. Mm. Um, so I created kind of this deck of 52 where there were four facets of an enemy faction. The party was part of a... Uh, secret society not unlike the blades from the elder scroll series and um they just kind of slowly built their base up over time uh, the the actual campaign did not go all the way to fruition but i had about 50 pages of work that i still pull from to this day when i need something oh wow <laughs> yeah yeah i over prepared i over prepared um, but I think a lot of DMs, they, they overprepare their first few sessions or their first few campaigns, and then they realize sort of the magic behind the curtain, and then 50 pages turns into maybe just five or six just to catch the highlights, and you, you kind of sort of wing it from there. <laughs> Uh, the magic of winging it, I've actually heard quite a few stories of DMs just winging a one-year to a five-year campaign. 
Ian. <laughs> well, it's it's. I wouldn't say it's all winging it. It's going in with a, a vague idea of where you want the story to go or what you want to present to the party. If you can go in with the understanding of, uh, I, I guess your starter hook is someone is trying to obtain something, but they're having difficulty for a reason, mm -hmm. so they defer to the party. Mm. Once you have that kind of starting formula, you can build a campaign off of just about anything. Okay. And it, it sort of it sort of goes from there, and then you, you you sort of catch the idea of what your party likes to do, especially in the first few sessions. Either they're not a talker and they just want to fight, in which case you throw lots of monsters at them, or they'll ask you about what the state flower is, and <laughs> then you gotta look up different types of names for flowers, write them down on a list. And like those uh, Facebook, what is your name or something based on your birthday? <laughs> okay, it's this. It, it's it's the I don't know, the salacious rose of the um, Venerian plain, something like that. Yeah, we'll go with that. That's the state rose. <laughs> he Did literally, and he literally just thought of that right in, on the spot. <laughs> He's had to do that multiple times. He's experienced. <laughs> I've I've had players actively try to attempt to thwart me and put me in an I don't know situation. And when you've done that Aww. for four years, uh, you, you tend to catch on. Uh, Actually, I, I kind of had an opposite experience to you, Vin. That very first session of mine, I I prepared. I prepared about three hours of a game. It went 12. <laughs> I, yeah. I remember the first three hours, I was just like, here's a goblin cave. <laughs> oh, you guys got through the goblin cave. Uh, well, now something weird went on in town and now you're in jail. Break out of jail. <laughs> well, I quickly try to figure out something. And the entire time, the group just is having fun thinking that all of this is planned. All of this is part of the game. <laughs> All right, so okay, I'm I'm a player or I'm a normal normal person, and I'm fired up. I watched a few episodes of Critical Role, and now I'm just like, okay, I'm ready. I want to start my D and D group. I want to start my own tabletop gaming group. This is it. Now what? <laughs> so you have this idea, but now you're just like, okay, what do I do now? <laughs> Um, probably the first and biggest piece of advice I would give to anyone who has looked at something big and popular and thought, Ooh, I can do that. Uh, pump the brakes. Yeah. yeah. Like, I don't mean, I don't mean don't do it. Like, mm -hmm. don't, don't for a minute think I'm not saying no, no. what I'm saying is you're, you're literally watching days of, or you're literally watching the Avengers and thinking, you know, I could pretend. <laughs> on camera. Yeah. Yeah. That is true. Yeah. yeah. And and you never know. You could get the hang of things and, and learn how it works. You could become really good at video editing. You could do your own superhero parodies and stuff on YouTube. And, you know, you could be like uh, some, some, I don't know any specific big names, but like Freddie Wong rings a bell. Um, you, you could go way into the YouTube rabbit hole and become big. Um you're probably never going to produce a, a blockbuster Hollywood video. Um, but I'd certainly say you'll be inspired just as at the level of dedication mm. that is displayed in critical role. Be, be inspired by it. Don't expect it's going to happen. I have never had a critical role esque table. I'm sure Ian's never had it. Um, I'm you, so you sorry. You'd be hard pressed <laughs> to find something, uh, similar to it. Uh, <clears throat> because, D and D is, it's not a show. Hmm. You know, I'm I'm just it. It's weird because originally Critical Role started as just a bunch of people hanging out having fun, and yeah. then they got a multi million dollar budget, and now it's this big production. Keep as yeah, they've tried to keep as much of the table heart as it is. But come on, when you're when you're dealing with like million dollar props, and you've got a budget where you can do your own animated series. There's no way that you don't put get a little bit of, of Hollywood show mm -hmm. into it. 
I still think at the heart it's it's D and D, but it's it's D and D with an expertise that goes far beyond anything the average person can do. Yeah, because I think I noticed that um, a lot of the common common er- or a lot of the commentaries when it comes to like uh, Critical Role or LA by Night. Ian and I started watching LA by Night. You get a lot of people that are like, "Man, this makes me really want to play. This makes me want to try it out." And I, it you get that sense of uh, expectation as a as a DM. You expect your players to act that way, and then as players, I don't know what you expect as a player. Do you expect your na- your your friend to be like the people? on the show do you expect the dm to be like the person on the show and do you expect yourself to just be sitting back and watching because that's what you're doing when you're watching critical role you're just watching and you're just enjoying the entertainment that they're putting out but then when you're actually playing you are the entertainer (laughs) i think people forget that you are the entertainer you're the one that's supposed to put on a voice or a show or whatever (laughs) I mean, it's very much the whole... I'm going to actually bring in sports here. It's very Mm -hmm. much like watching the NFL and being like, oh, I want to play like, you know, I want to play football. And then trying to get a group of guys from your... (laughs) NFL players. I mean, can you guys play football? Most definitely. Can you guys have fun doing it? Yeah. Will some people maybe sit and watch? Maybe. Depends, but it's not going to be anything like the NFL. No, no. Um, and, and it would be, it, it's the still, still the same concept though of, you know, what they're playing is football, but there's definitely a show element to it. So I see what you mean. Football is the one with the, 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 the kicking back and forth right now. <laughs> it's the one with the, South. I better know what football is. I'll have a houndstooth crucifix thrown at me in a heart. <laughs> it's the round ball. <laughs> Right, kind of the oval, the oval, the brown egg. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm a nerd. <laughs> not a football nerd. <laughs> oh man, but yeah, I think that's because when we started, wa- I started watching Critical Role. I haven't seen like a whole lot of it. I've seen a few episodes here and there, a few clips. You know, the funny clips, and I. Mm-hmm. I was like, dang, they got actual actors in here. Like, legit actors. I'm not a legit actor. <laughs> I I play me really good. <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah. But, and then we saw LA by Night. And it was the same thing. Like, they would, you know, they got, got into semi-costumes and makeup. And they're actual actors. One of them plays, like, a lot of monster roles. So he knows how to do those growls. And those really neat kind of like monster voices. I was like, yeah, I can't do that. I mean, that's the most I could do. (laughs) So then, you know, and you're watching them, and and then you and then you start your little group. (laughs) You start your little group, and and then and then and then you don't know what happens (laughs) next. And then you realize that level of prep is pretty rough. And yeah. You start, you know, running around looking for something to, to, to justify your 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 decisions. I will say, uh, as far as critical role goes, uh, a good example I give of what you could expect from not professional voice actors, mm-hmm. but something a little more closer to home um, is their Deadlands. Uh, three episode series I think they did mm-hmm. uh, I loved that one because it was it it wasn't I mean it was super high production like ridiculously high production like they brought in uh, Victorian era clothes they had like a saloon set up but the actual game was not that complicated okay they were they were definitely doing their professional mm-hmm. voice acting thing but the the, the core game the rules like they took time to explain things it was a lot of fun Mm -hmm. Uh, so so i think probably if i wouldn't look at the critical role show as an example but i would definitely look at some of the side things they do um and and i definitely would not be intimidated by big shows that's probably 
point number two. Point number one is tap the brakes. Yeah. Know, critical role. <laughs> but point number two is, um, you know, you probably have a budget of $10 and a paperclip a month <laughs> to put things together. And that's okay <clears throat> because, I mean, number one, there's plenty of resources mm. that you can use to, to jump into things. You don't even need the books half the time. Uh, hmm. And I, you, mm -hmm. I was just going to say, actually, that's where I wanted to veer into the next question. It's like, what do I need to get to start my uh, game? The free, uh, the free source reference document. <laughs> that's it. That's all you need to get started. Um, mm -hmm. Because it, it's kind of like a trial run of Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, okay. If you're playing locally, I would, if you're playing locally and you want to do like a close knit table, I would say pull together and get uh, one of the two starter sets, whichever one you can find. Uh, they're actually in Walmart now. Oh, I, I saw that the other day. D and D Walmart kid section. It's in the board games. Okay. Um, Walmart. I see yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. I see you. Okay. They know what's up. <laughs> they're down with the kids. Um, yeah, but of course, in this day and age, probably most people are looking at doing stuff online because you know mm -hmm. the, the countries as as they are right now. You know, a lot of places are still locked down, and realistically, all you need is a dedicated Discord server bot to do roles. Really, if you mm -hmm. really want to push it bare minimum for like yeah. absolutely free stuff if you want to get a little bit more fancy fantasy grounds if you want to spend some money roll 20 if you don't uh mm. boundary i believe is what it's called right Vin? boundary is one of the new kids on the block it's it's coming in as kind of a hybrid between fantasy grounds and roll 20 and i, I wouldn't mind doing a quick breakdown of those roll 20 is completely web-based um and it's web it's web-based it's free, uh, but you do get what you pay for. So the more free you go with Roll20, the more work you have to put in to prep. You can mm. start buying little things here and there with Roll20, uh, and, and it can kind of help some. But uh, Roll20 is kind of the, the aging platform in the okay. tabletop industry. Uh, mm. Fantasy Grounds is, is sort of the, the flashy one. It came in and said, you know, anything Roll20 can do, I can do better. Be you just got to give me money to do it. <laughs> Spend hundreds of dollars on Fantasy Grounds. Holy. And you, what? yeah. What? Hundreds. No. Yeah. On what? Yeah. What am I paying for? <laughs> uh, or one. Books. Uh, well, you're paying for the automation. I would say that's the big thing. Like you're, you're not so much paying for the books because you can get access to the books anywhere else. Uh, what you're paying for is all the automation that comes in with the books. Because these these the people over at Fantasy Grounds, they're not just taking the books, putting them in their game engine, and giving it to you. They're going in and they're automating everything: roles, status effects, any new NPCs, maps, <clears throat> you name it. It's in there. Um, Foundry, like I said, it's kind of the new kid on the block. It's a little more streamlined than Roll20. Uh, but the interesting thing about it is it has an open source uh, rule set builder. So long as you know the basics of, some, of a programming language, I forget which one it is, uh, you can make your own rule sets. So, you know, a lot of people have made rule sets. Some are a little bootleg. Some are reliant on you having the books some mm -hmm. not so much um so you you kind of take what you what you get with that um i think once foundry gains some popularity i think that's going to kind of slowly overtake roll 20 mm -hmm. um unless and this is the big thing unless roll 20 comes out with the mobile app they've been promising to do for a year now Ooh. Okay. If if they do that, then you know I think they'll have a, a big advantage on the block again. Um, but bare minimum that you need, yeah, you're right. Uh, if you if you want to set up a free Discord bot, or if you trust everyone, have them put a free dice app on their phone. You yeah, know. Uh, and I also feel like apart from the pandemic, I mean, I know growing up, all of my like friends, other than uh, Peter and my brother 
all of my actual friends were like online people. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, I mean, even after the pandemic, I think online tabletop role playing is still going to be pretty much a thing because you can play with a lot of different people from other parts of the country. So, that's also something to keep in mind. And we'll be sure to put the links on, well, what they mentioned when it comes to Roll20 and all the other sites. So, we'll be sure to put a breakdown and click on the links and yeah so you got your materials you got your you got your your little group online or in person that's the feat <laughs> this is it what are some questions that you as a dm need to ask of your players before playing uh, am i gonna have to hunt you guys down an hour before gameplay starts or are y'all actually gonna make it <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's a I, thing <laughs> i'm only partially joking um it real like the honest truth is if you have a group that is going to make it on time congratulations you have completed 80 percent of <laughs> the Maybe? the other 20 <laughs> yeah, the other 20%, it's 80% getting a group together, 10% kicking back, and 10% relaxing. That sounds pretty... Oh, you know what? That sounds easier said than done, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I think the... Uh, I feel like if if you're listening to this and you're like in school, like high school, let's just say... Um, your schedule is pretty set. You know, you go to school throughout the day, you come home at 3 p.m. You have Friday night, Saturday and Sunday free. You don't really have that big of responsibilities other than maybe like chores around the house. So you can, you have a steady schedule, but then once you start hitting your 20s and you have college and then you have a job, a side job, a family, you know, all of these other responsibilities air quotes (laughs) it becomes a lot harder to get your group of friends together so in the beginning you're all gung-ho on this you're like yes let's do it and it's like oh man i dude i'm so sorry i I actually got pulled for a double shift (laughs) oh man i gotta i gotta study because i have a test tomorrow morning you know and yeah so i would say getting your group together talking over what everyone's schedule is and trying to find that one sweet spot where everybody is free is definitely one of those conversations that you have to have right at the get go. Mm -hmm. And honestly though, this this actually does lead into um, a type of, of tabletop gaming that has actually gained a lot of popularity on discord. Uh, Almost like a, it's almost a Renaissance of the OG forum role playing communities uh, that has that it, it's kind of something that's come back out of necessity. If you can't get a set time for everyone to play, uh, then then what you do is you get on Discord and you, you basically do like we used to do in the old forums. You would type up your story, and other people would declare their actions. And uh, I forget how things worked in those old forums, but now you have a discord bot that can handle the roles. So, um, you've got that, but let's say you do get everyone together. You've got a set time. You think, okay, look, we're going to, uh, we're going to one way or another have X amount of hours set aside. Uh, at that point, what the DM needs to be asking is what kind of game are you looking for? Like what are you what are you looking to do? Hmm. Um, I always tell people to write or write down or in a single sentence, give me an achievement your character will make in this game. Oh man, I'm already freezing up. Like oh, wh- what what is my character? <laughs> oh shoot! An, an <laughs> what just pick an achievement? Um, uh, you'll find a pattern. You okay. Find a pattern amongst your players. For instance, I had uh, I had a table that had grown to about ten players. Whoa! Don't worry, we 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 broke into two tables for a reason. <laughs> um, 
like half of them wanted to tell a big story half of them just wanted to kill stuff this tends so, to be the two major groups. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so I was like, all right, well, you know, I wasn't doing anything at the time. I, I had an eight to five show up, play game or show up, do work, go home type mm -hmm. job. Um, I missed that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but, you know, I had one of those types of jobs. And so I could honestly, I could spend a lot of time at the job prepping. Mm -hmm. And so I, I ran two games a week. Wow. Um, it was like, all right, one week was the combat team and they went ahead of the role playing team. Um, so the combat team would clear out anything super dangerous. And then the role playing team would come in and they'd have a couple of occasional encounters, but it was nothing that was particularly uh, deadly or required a whole lot of tactical knowledge. Um, <clears throat> but there are a lot of things they can do as players. You will find some people want to find magic items. Some people want to um, start a nation. I mean, you, you have to ask them, what is it you want to do in this campaign? Mm. And then you as the GM can realistically take what you want to do and apply it to what they want to do. Because that's what's going to give you the best story mm -hmm. is a mix of the two. Because the GM is not going to get... The GM is going to burn out if all they're doing is catering to the players. Mm. The players are going to get bored if all they're doing is catering to the GM. Okay. I think shortly after, what do you want to do is what don't you want to do? Which is when mm. you start getting into, you know, uh, the most common one is lines and veils currently. Basically, what are you comfortable or not comfortable with putting a hard line on it or what are you okay with existing but not being shown just fading to black on it uh, in my case just because I do tend to do Call of Cthulhu and Chronicles of Darkness which are more horror themed those I tend to touch on probably before even the characters uh, give me their aspirations so to speak just because running because I'm not running the generic, you know, fantasy setting. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah, because I think um, Ian and I were... We we watched, like, uh, other, you know, YouTubers and other forums. Uh, we read other forums and articles and things like that. And that's something that can turn off a lot of people from playing is when certain topics are touched. And it makes the player feel very very uncomfortable to the point where they're no longer having fun and they just would rather not play anymore yeah i uh i have a good example okay um when i when i first moved to where i'm at now we went to the local game shop and they had a big problem because there was a bunch of adults wanting to run adult D, &D games and i don't mean like r-rated or anything but it was guys and gals wanting to hang out with each other 20s and 30s and they had a group i think it was i think it was a family uh with a few kids that wanted to run a more kid friendly D. &D. Mm -hmm. dad didn't know how to do it he he had played D, D but never gm before and so they were looking for a gm that would basically make a kid friendly D, &D. so it did and realistically, the game didn't change that much. Like there was, um, th there was stuff where I would I would come to the the dad and I'd say, okay, here's what I got coming down the pipe. Any of this you want me to cut out? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we would kind of like tailor it just a little bit, but there really wasn't a whole lot of change that happened. Um, which you know, I still remember one time the dad actually. Uh, looked at me and said, you know, my, my son's been doing like really bad in school. And since we started D&D, &D, he's writing and I've never seen him write so much. His handwriting's looking so much better. He'd be doing reports and they'd be grading him based on his handwriting. Mm -hmm. So, you know, his handwriting was atrocious. And so they removed points and also he was doing bad. And I think it was, I think it was English. Um, yeah. And then I basically I give him this assignment to like write stuff up and went right through it um but yeah it is important to talk to your players because session zero session zero is everything um 
It sets it the tone, I think. Yeah. It's the make or break. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, with, with any game. Yeah. Because uh, a good session zero will lead to a years long game. A bad session zero will lead to broken friendships. Ooh. And D and D is not about breaking friendships, right? It's about making wonderful memories that you're gonna talk about ten years from now, and you're like, remember that one time? Oh God, yeah. Go ahead and start sharing. <laughs> what is one of your? What What are some of your favorite like D and D tabletop role playing moments? <laughs> one and it's actually from that very first session that I ever did um, I had a cleric of Paylor and uh, they were having service and she was you know walking down the aisle with the incense you know the censer hmm. and the goblin uh, I had like a goblin den that was raiding the town the goblins in invade the church and then engage in combat with her. It's only two goblins. It wasn't meant to be anything really challenging for her. Well, the the rogue, the veteran player, was kind of standing at the door and, you know, he was shouting for the guards to come, but he wasn't going to intervene because, you know, he's a rogue. Uh, probably hoping just to pick off some money. And then her very first role ever in the game, 20, 20, 20 which we were going with the with the rule if you got 320s in a roll on to to hit you insta killed them she insta killed the goblin and then the the fight wrapped up very quickly after that and then the guards come after both of the goblins are dead and he's like what's going on here and the rogue just turns to him and goes that cleric in there just killed two goblins in one hit have you donated to the Church of Paylor today? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> uh, yeah. And again, for those of you who haven't played, that's actually a very funny joke. <laughs> it's just, yes, you have to actually play to get that. All right. <laughs> Vince? <laughs> yeah. um, well, I've, I've got... I've got a number of stories, probably the the ones that are the most memorable. Uh, I was playing, so this actually does require a little bit of backstory. Uh, after my first table or two, I think, uh, we were we had a geek bar that, for lack of better words, was dying. Oh. Like, there just wasn't a whole lot of business going to except on, like, the weekends. So they were looking at having to close except for Saturdays. Uh, and then in the area they were in, rent is pretty expensive so it, it was it was not looking good and i said well what's your most dead day you know what, what's your quietest day and they're like uh wednesday so i said okay um can we use the bar on wednesdays and i was like sure i was like <laughs> bring food like full kitchen open let me do this a couple of times Went on the went on their Facebook and put out a big notice saying, "Hey, I'm running a Dungeons and Dragons table. I am teaching how to play Dungeons and Dragons, and I want to see at least four tables of D and D at this bar on Wednesday. See you guys there." Uh, six tables later. Oh wow! <laughs> we are actually like six tables later. I had to buy an awning. Uh, with lighting so that we could set up outside because there were just that many people playing D and D on Wednesdays in a bar in a dry County. <laughs> oh, Definitely dry County. <laughs> um, but it doesn't stop there because people would actually like, uh, I mean, this wasn't that long ago, but it almost felt like, being a Twitch celebrity because people would like come in and they'd buy us food and drinks um, and lots of water for me. <laughs> well, that's, well, that's good. <laughs> you know, and, and like we, we gathered a crowd. There's like some 20 odd people who would come and watch us over time. Wow. Um, not all the time, but a lot of time. But like, yeah. We'd gather crowds of people who would like sit around and watch our table. And then if they wanted to play, there was like six other tables inside that was just kind of playing 
realistically just kind of loose adventurers league mm-hmm. uh, which is which is sort of like a, a condensed soft D&D for lack of better words it's it's an organized play so there's a lot stricter rules you have to follow mm-hmm. but the concept is that a character can can go from one table to the next without having to worry about uh, their character being like overpowered or anything hmm. uh, but then there was our table, which was, you know, the big GM who was doing all the stories, who drew maps on graph paper, and um, we had, like, tables set up. I, so that's going on. And there are three instances that I remember that set off a series of chain of events in our party. Uh, number one, there was the wizard who, out of nowhere... Um, came up with some of the best lines ever in the party. Uh, I threw a war elephant at the party. Figuratively and literally. Wait, I'm uh, more curious about the literally. <laughs> well, literally in the game. What I mean by figuratively is that was their encounter. The literally part was that it, it did, in fact, get telekinesis catapulted into the tavern they were in. I, I hope everybody's picturing that right now. <laughs> yeah, just just imagine you're sitting in the tavern, like you know, not a big tavern, like this really small tavern. You run across someone; it's in the middle of nowhere. They were there to meet a contact, um, and then all of a sudden, a war elephant crashes through the front. Just, like I'm saying, I'm talking. Do you remember James and the Giant Peach? Yeah, I'm talking that level of subtlety. Just, <laughs> Oh yeah, this kid was living a happy life, and then a rhinoceros ate his parents. <laughs> just <laughs> if you remember that, yeah, I do. <laughs> I was just like, yeah, I was like, yeah, you guys are in this quiet hovel. You're trying to, you know, the there was like a cult of Sylvanas and a nature goddess gone rogue that was is trying to hunt. That was trying to like stop the city from developing, and they had resorted to acts of natural terror. So yeah, throwing a war elephant at at <laughs> the conspirators and and all that. Um, anyway, the fight broke out. the The wizard acts, the the wizard kind of overcharged on a shatter spell and exploded the elephant into in, into elephant giblets all over the the tavern. Oh. Guards come in, they start arresting people left and right, and the wizard said, "Officers, thank goodness you're here." <laughs> Wait, but it was, it was his fault that it happened? It, it wasn't his fault that the <laughs> elephant went into the tavern. It was his fault that the elephant had been exploded. <laughs> oh, God. <sighs> See, it's, you play D&D and tabletop role-playing games for the moments. That's what you're playing for. You're creating stories for you and your friends to like look back on and be like remember that one time where you exploded a giant elephant in the bar yeah, we refer to it as the pachyderm pinata no that's just wrong <laughs> ew no <laughs> there was there was the time that the party had discovered or i mean there was there was an elvish city that had discovered an orcish city and the two had been in kind of a cold war for a long time. And I did not intend to complicate the matter because the party just wanted to fight. So I was just going to give them an orc city to go hit. And then one of our party wizards, I've realized bards might be the charisma class, but wizards are the ones who will mess things up. <laughs> throw a wrench into things. Facts. Bards which just bard things. You know, they'll get you out of problems. Wizards get you into them. Um, so the wizard decides he's going to pop invisibility, go into the orc city. And I'm like, oh, great. Now I got to think about what I'm going to do with the orc city. And then like a week of planning all that. I'm like, you're, I come to realize I had made this giant, I'd, I'd made this like functional society for orcs. And I didn't want to just get rid of it. So. So I came up with this whole plot twist of, you know, the orc is headed by a chieftain who has a a, uh, circulate that gives him very high intellect. 
And as a result, he was leading these orcs into becoming a more civilized society. However, they still had their traditions. One of their traditions was the hunting of large beasts out on the plains as a rite of passage uh, or rite of maturity for their children. And the elves had basically cut off the orcs' access so none of their kids could grow into adults through that rite of passage anymore. And in their mind, the gods were punishing them for it with bad crops. (laughs) Thing is, thing is, the elves were trying to protect the forest or that region because the orcs were over-harvesting. So it was not this cut and dry, and 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 I'm going to try not to tangent on this too much. I cannot stand the, the cut and dry D and D plots, yeah. that we um, see all to, or just any tabletop RPG plots. Like, if if I'm going to create a conflict like this, both sides are going to have legitimate grievances. Hmm. Major DM tip: It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how one sided you want it to be. It's not fair if it's one sided, and it's not. It's not fun. It, it's lacking creativity because memorable memorable reasonable conflict does not occur without two potentially vindicated sides um so yeah both sides just kind of had this impasse that they were both at the party i kid you not they set up a a meeting space and then when it came time to actually do the the meeting live one side of the party represented the elves, one one side of the party represented the orcs as ambassadors, not the players, mind you, or, or rather the players were playing as completely different characters for that session to have a round table sit down. Hmm. So like we had we had six players, three or it was no, we had seven players. Three of them were were playing completely different orc characters for the purposes of the story. Three of them were playing completely different elf characters for the purposes of the story. And then we had the Druid who was supposed to educate. Uh, I think the reason for that being was we had to wait until next week for some reason. I could not remember the exact specifics, but I do know that the next week or the week before one or the other, what they did was I had the, the actual players and their actual original characters basically running perimeter defense to make sure that this, discussion happened without any interference their their bad guy that they had been hunting this whole time showed up because he had a vested interest in making sure that this cold war turned hot um plot twist and and that was another thing i had let this note between two players one elf one orc uh, i'd left a note between both of them and they both knew each, and and the the plot twist was that the general of the orc army and the general of the elven army actually had at one point in time worked together very closely. So it all kind of like tied in together. Uh, It turned out beautifully. Um, And they got to fight a gnome using uh, a gnome riding a giant T-Rex shooting laser beams. Yay. I love gnomes. It was a gnome bar (laughs) shooting laser beams, riding a giant T-Rex. That was, that was the boss fight I threw at them. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Yes. <laughs> That's exactly what we need. <laughs> the giant beasts from the plains were dinosaurs. They were coming from an, a whole other plane of existence. There was a portal uh, that was coming from the forest, and they'd leave the forest, roam out into the plains. The orcs would hunt them. I think... All right. So for me, I, I'm only really thinking about one experience that I could think of right now, and... It was one of our first D&D groups when Ian and I first moved out here in California. And my brother's character fell through a trap, like floor trap. And my character just was trying to help, genuinely trying to help, okay? Good intentions and all. I wrapped some rope around me. And I was just like, all right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to rescue him, okay? And then everybody's chatting. Everybody's talking. Every- all the other players are talking about, oh, man, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Da, 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 da. And I'm like, all right, guys. All right. And I leap. And then Ian, the DM, was just like, um, 
So your gnome just leapt into the hole. Does anybody have hold of said rope? Oh, oh, oh crap. Fine. I, I roll for it. Uh, my friend rolled for it and he failed. So then my next friend was like, fine, fine, fine. How about I roll for it too? And he failed too. And it's just like, guys, the floor is getting bigger. <laughs> And splat! I landed right on top of my brother's character, so now he has more damage <laughs> taken on. I have damage, and of course my brother's character is like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm here to save you. <laughs> I'm here to help you. And yeah, that... It just happened. I... <sighs> so that was my experience uh, with a gnome trying to be helpful and... Um, it wasn't my fault. Somebody must have. Somebody needed to get a hold of the rope. <laughs> uh, but apparently, it was too much to ask. Uh, and you know what? I was just thinking. Um, my brother, my brother, and I have always been kind of like uh, growing up, player one, and I was always player two. And I follow these other uh, podcasters. I don't know what they're called. And called uh, Dungeons and Dads, and they're pretty awesome. They're uh, Britishy, I think, <laughs> and they are literally two dads that play Dungeons and Dragons with their kids now. And their kids are damn creative. I'm just like, I can't. What? <laughs> they thought of these amazing characters, and what? <laughs> and I think one of the dads literally created, uh, basically Nacho Libre. He created a. Uh, uh, he created a monk by day he wore his monk clothing and then by night he was like a luchador type guy so and i was just thinking that if you know even as adults like if you can't find time with your friends or anything i think this would also be a nice way to kind of nerd out with your kids and make it like a family thing too so i i grew up with a pretty big family like it was my brother, my two, three nephews, my younger sister, apart from our actual friends. So I think this is also a nice way to kind of engage with your kids. Uh, I think, what, seven is a good age to start? I could be wrong, I think. Um, D&D, yeah, they just, they need the, they need to be able to just, realistically, they just need the, the basics of being able to, to count. Mm -hmm. Um. Just, just kind of work the way up. I would say if you want to start them younger, then, you know, like if you want to do like five or six, give them some kind of inspiration to work off of and just run with it. Hmm. Uh, don't actually focus on, on the D&D &D side of it. I wouldn't worry about that. The mechanics. Yeah, don't do the mechanics. Like, treat it like just a basic glorified board game. Single <laughs> dice. You know, you're just... Just make believe, let it happen, and then when they get older, then it, they can introduce things uh, like different kind of rules. I'd say once they start showing uh, just sort of the the knowledge of how rules work and how to follow them, that would be a pretty good point to start introducing some fundamentals mm -hmm. of D and D. Uh, like the biggest thing I think would also be attention <laughs> span. <laughs> it, it, if your kid can't sit still. Uh, maybe it's just not for them. <clears throat> you know. What I was thinking was um, the beauty of kids, honestly, is the fact that they have such a huge imagination most of the time. And they're, they haven't really learned embarrassment. So they don't mind putting on a fake cape. And they don't mind acting like a wizard. And they... Have you know if you're ignoring the mechanics for the most part, then you can actually engage with your kids and have fun acting out your characters without feeling foolish. Because I feel like once you start playing tabletop role playing games as an adult, you kind of develop that sense of insecurity where you don't want to put on voices and you don't want to act silly in front of like your friends because you're an adult and adults do you know mature things and that doesn't involve acting i guess i don't know but yeah <laughs> so i think if you start them out young and you get them 
relaxed and confident in pl- actually just playing and role playing, I think that'll actually lead them once they get older to feel more relaxed as, you know, maybe more role playing, you know, when it comes to like D&D and stuff. Mm-hmm. It's it's one of those things where um, it, it is a developmental issue. Mm-hmm. You've got to start very, very simple at the beginning, work your way up, and you're teaching skills that kids are going to learn, that the kids need to learn. Um, you're, you're teaching, number one, you are teaching them how to sit still and to pay attention. Mm-hmm. That comes with the territory. Um, it, it, it can be difficult for younger kids. But, you know, you get them in that environment where they do have a period of something that they enjoy doing it's it becomes easy for them to sit and pay attention during that and then it'll make it easier for when it's less enjoyable things <laughs> over time um the fact that they can do it leads credibility to them actually having to do it um you know you're teaching math you're teaching reading if you kind of you know do it correctly um teamwork Puzzles. More leadership, <laughs> puzzle solving, morality, mm-hmm. um, you know, decision making, the, uh, you know, crisis acting just about, you know, the ability to, to look at a really bad situation and decide the best possible course of action. Uh, there's a number of things that can, can come with that. Um, you know, memorizing. Mm-hmm. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, memorizing the rules for yourself. In that family uh, session or game campaign that we had, uh, one of the kids became a nature paladin. And they have oaths to uphold the forest, to protect wildlife, to you know respect nature, that sort of thing. And I did not have a rule book ready to <laughs> thump the kid on the head when he... If he forgot his oaths, that was completely on him mm-hmm. to follow those rules. And he wrote them down. And kept track of him. And anytime he had to make a big decision, he would stop and look at that and say, all right, well, you know, this is what my characters take sworn an oath to do. What am I going to do? How am I going to respond? And he did. Oftentimes it required the paladin doing something that ended in them getting hurt. But that was what they swore to do. And that's how it worked. Okay. Ian, you were going to say something? Uh, I've lost my train of thought, so it's fine. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that's just a podcast that I started following and listening to, and I just thought that was such a great idea if you're the only nerd in your group of friends. Because <laughs> sometimes that happens. like you're you Or you have nerdy friends who just don't want to play, you know. But, you know, if you have little ones or you know you're married and whatever and you can make it into like a family night you know i thought that was such an ingenious thing to do you know it's i thought that was something really fun um i did also like about you um vince uh kind of making it a community thing with the bar the dying bar (laughs) you know Mm -hmm. So that's definitely something that I never even thought about and something that maybe once things start opening up again, especially with your local, you know, restaurant, local bistro, local, especially when it comes to like some comic book shops that aren't as popping as others. Mm -hmm. Some are pretty good. Some are off. You know, some are like always packed all the time. I'm talking about the ones that are kind of in tucked away in a little corner and <laughs> nobody knows about. That's something that, you know, if you can't find your own group of friends, you know, put up a flyer. Maybe not a flyer. In Craigslist. No, totally. ad. You'll put up a flyer. Flyer. <laughs> <don't go> <laughs> <laughs> looking, looking for role playing people. Yeah, definitely don't. Yep. <laughs> no, never mind. That's. That's a special section on Craigslist that you, I mean, if you if you want to, but you know, anyway. <laughs> yeah, nah, don't do that. This is this is we're talking Craigslist now, not Backpage. <laughs> yeah, so never mind. Maybe maybe a flyer, or you know, let people know on Facebook, or make some some kind of like 
declaration announcement there we go not declaration and it doesn't even, here's the thing it doesn't even have to be dungeons and dragons mm -hmm. like around here you tend to get more um you, you tend to get more i guess you could say positive reaction uh with anything that's not dungeons and dragons hmm. you know it's you know I, I can call it pathfinder I can call it uh, a story-based adventure. I can come up. I can come up with a rule set name of my own. I can pick a rule set I've been playing. Uh, as long as I don't use the Dungeons and Dragons buzzword, it tends to get a positive response. Uh. Um, but then everyone and their cousins play in D and D at the uh, local game place, mm -hmm. and when they do, they're competing with the Magic the Gathering kids. And there's no competing with Magic the Gathering people when they start arguing over rules. <laughs> we joke about rules lawyers in in D and D. Nah. Yeah, I'm looking at you, Ian. <laughs> MTG kids are brutal. <laughs> I, I I I took third place in a tournament, so I. <laughs> I've seen I've seen what a blue eyes white dragon can do to a jugular vein. Oh God. <laughs> No, I'm just I was gonna say that's not magic though. That's uh, Yu-Gi-Oh. <laughs> See, that shows how little I know. <laughs> okay, point taken. <laughs> I know much. I know as much about Magic the Gathering as I do football. Oh, uh, mm -mm, mm -mm. Uh, but yeah. So that was. So that's a bit of our tips and tricks and some experience when it comes to DMing for the first time. If you guys are curious about it, I think we can all agree that honestly, it's just throwing yourself and hope that you hit the ground running. If not, at least a nice leisure pace, <laughs> you know? So that's, that's pretty much the main thing is you want a DM, then just do it, you know? And don't be that jerk that's like, oh, I want a D&D group but I'm not going to go ahead and put the effort into it. I'm going to let other people, like, m put the effort into creating a group. No, it's like if you want to make the group, then just make the group and just throw yourself into it. Yeah, I would say put in put in the effort to make the group, but don't mm -hmm. feel pressured to be a DM. Mm. Um, there's there's a big difference between the guy who coordinates everything and, and the game master. Uh, I've had a number of tables where... I was asked to show up at a time. I said, yeah, I can run at this time. And someone else handled the coordination and where we were going to be and all that stuff. Um, that's probably tip number three for me as a GM is learn when you're not a GM. Because mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of people who are great players and they're great at coordinating things. They're great at getting the, the table together, but I wouldn't let them behind the GM screen. <laughs> And you, you shouldn't feel pressure to be behind the GM screen. If you are unreasonably uncomfortable behind the GM screen, then, then you know, find someone else who feels a little more comfortable. You're going to feel uncomfortable. Like, like, oh, well, yeah. <laughs> don't, don't just quit because you feel awkward. Mm -hmm. But if you find that you're, you're arguing with people or you're not asserting your position as the GM, or the stuff you're coming up with is just not working out, let someone else GM. Mm -hmm. Focus on coordinating the table. Make your GM's life easier that way. Yeah. Definitely everybody has a role when it comes to playing the game. It's a team game. Mm -hmm. Regardless if you're a player or a DM, it's you're all in a group. Um, and I think that's something that I guess you can take away from Critical Role and all those other fancy tabletop game shows is that you put in what you want to take out, I guess, so to speak. You know, if you want other people to be acting and putting on a show, but you're just kind of behind just watching and not actually putting in that same amount of effort that you're expecting other people to do that's not right you know so you have to actually put in the effort and i think i learned that personally once i actually tried dming the second time the second time i actually the second time i tried dming was a, a vampire tabletop rpg and i was actually trying to read the rules and thinking of a storyline and blah 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 all of this stuff and that's when i actually found out just how much work goes into 
a good content creative game not just something that you just pull out of your ass but like you know something that and, and I found out just how upsetting it can be when your players either don't show up or they don't show up on time or they're just like oh yeah oh uh, whatever um yeah I didn't read anything you know I I kind of found a new respect and perspective towards people who dm or gm on a regular basis i did not realize that until i got on the hot seat so to speak <laughs> so if you haven't dm'd and you've been curious about it i do suggest at least trying it once because you do kind of see just how much work goes into creating this world this fantasy world that you're you and your friends are enjoying and then you know at the same time you might realize hey I, I actually like dming too and then your normal your, your your normal dm that usually does all the prepping he can take a break too <laughs> I, i've heard of dm burnouts before <laughs> that is a thing <laughs> dm burnouts usually come usually occur when there's a problem at the table um, and i've definitely been there Mm. We had uh, we had a ranger in one of our tables who really, really liked the creature summon spells. Is that a bad thing? Oh, I see Ian's face. Um. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It's it's definitely a valid. It is a valid choice for a character. It is. But uh, assuming it's 3.5 or Pathfinder, the edition I'm most familiar with, especially if you give the players control of those creatures, that one player has now just soaked up three hours of the combat time while everybody's just sitting there on their phone. Yeah. Well, it gets worse in 5th edition. Oh, dear. Um, because in 5th edition, the rules explicitly state, your DM will provide a list at the time of casting of what kinds of creatures are available for you to summon. Sounds so, about right. <laughs> yeah, so not only have... So, so to the people listening, allow me, allow me to explain. There's a number of, of summoning spells that you can do in, in Dungeons & Dragons. Most of them summon one maybe two creatures of from of whatever reason and a lot of times it's tied to a class that is reliant on having that creature so you you tend to they tend to have the creature on hand it's something they can pull out set down and it's like okay doesn't doesn't take much time but there are some spells in the game especially on the nature side of things where you summon like a pack of eight wolves well Dungeons and Dragons is turn-based, and the rules state each of those wolves has to have their own turn. So, D and D can be a little sluggish in combat, especially if you have players that are either not very good at math, or don't read their spell sheets, or don't understand their character abilities, or aren't paying attention, or aren't coordinating. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> Those are all me sometimes. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. So, so you know, you've got you've got general mayhem, and and the a single turn in D and D can can last forever. So for someone to throw like eight critters into it, oh. uh, initiative attack rolls, damage rolls, abilities, it, it it's a nightmare. Um, that wasn't really the problem. Per se, like it's something I could have worked with mm -hmm. if they were if they were good about it. <laughs> the problem was there was kind of a subplot going on where the party was being tracked. They oh, didn't dear. know they were being tracked. <laughs> they didn't know that someone was actively coordinating the enemies that were fighting against them. Um, so fireball got used a lot more. <laughs> because the party had a bad habit of bunching up and you know this person would have all their wolves do big attacks and they'd like gang up on something so you know fireball scorching or fireball fire spray uh, cone of cold that kind of thing you know the real heavy hitters that are meant to punish people grouping up started getting used a lot more the player kind of took it personally 
Oops. Kind of, kind of felt personally targeted. <laughs> they would summon eight wolves and then get fireballed, and most, if not all, of them would die as a result. Oof. Um. And, and you know, I was, I was being that GM that like exploited their sensitivities in 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 game uh, because the thing that was watching them was actually uh, a catalyst for the big bad evil guy in the group or in the party and he was using a teacup owl bear that hmm. the party had fallen in love with that was actually his familiar oh he he teacup. conjured he conjured up it's like Sized <laughs> owl bear, like it fit in a backpack, oh, and it, was yeah, so and party loved it. it made the perfect scrying tool for the enemy. <laughs> no, oh. so, so imagine the paladin having this thing as like his 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 loved beloved pet this whole time, and the bad guy has the 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 mid epic moment where the the party is nigh defeated and he leaves them to their fate but not before whistling and the little owl bear jumps up on his shoulder as he teleports out oh. like oh my word my heart just pooped <laughs> 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 oh so yeah. cute <laughs> yeah see sometimes we get a little evil as GMs but we, we mean it for the purposes of telling a good story we have to be the bad guy or from so time they, to time or so they comes say. with the territory mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and that's another thing, you know. If you don't, if you don't like the party looking at you with with disdain because you did something bad, <laughs> bad, bad in a storytelling way. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. Like you know, when 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 you do things as a GM to like set the evil, and they're like, oh my god, gosh, what is wrong with you? It's like my me. my work here is done. <laughs> uh, I love I love. Um, what is it? The Gamers. It's a it's a movie series. I love the line on there because the the they're waiting for one of the players to show up, and it, it kind of has this back and forth where it's the players sitting at the table, and then it's the players, but they're all dressed up as their characters, mm -hmm. acting as though it's actually happening at the table. So the monk is like pacing back and forth, uh, and it's like if he's not here in thirty minutes, we're killing this guy, right? <laughs> and and the villain is like. Firm but fair. He goes, you shut up. <laughs> I'm the antagonist. Can I not antagonize? And it's funny because it is the GM's voice coming through this character. So, it, so you just you, you it's happening in the the D and D world. But those are the things. It's clearly implied. Those are the things they're saying at the table level. Mm. So, <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> yeah, I highly recommend that. Um, I actually, you know what? That's what I would say. I would say if you want a better interpretation of what your standard D and D game is, go watch uh, the Gamers. I believe it's uh, what was the name of it? Yes, uh, Dead Gentleman Productions. Hmm. Don't know why they call themselves that, but it's the Gamers. Why not? Dorkness. <laughs> that's. <laughs> All right, so we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. So just a few final just thoughts, okay? And mm -hmm. just basically just say, kind of like in a list form. So we went over, so you want a DM, now what? So we went over uh, some of the things to kind of do, such as hit the brakes <laughs> before you start because in case you watched Critical Role or anything that was highly productive, like production-wise, with lots of money and actual paid actors to do it, yeah, hit the brakes on that because you're probably not going to get that out of your first few ever D&D &D sessions. <laughs> if ever. I mean, if you ever get to that point, awesome. Send me a link and I'll watch you, <laughs> you know, but for the most part, yeah, you're not going to get that kind of production level. Um, and then second, uh, what were some of the items, some of the material that you guys recommended? Uh, for a local table, I just, I honestly just recommend the D&D &D starter set. Okay. It's, it's cheap. 
it's an easy entry level thing to get into and you can continue playing D&D beyond that if you want to go and make your own stuff because there's free resources all online that you can just pull and keep playing with those characters uh, for online tables I'd almost recommend the same thing but there's a lot of uh, like I think Roll20 has the minds of the, that entry book free now, Okay, I think and if they don't someone's modded it in because it's basically it, the the workshop there is kind of like the steam workshop where someone's got a mod that puts it in there um at least a little bit Mm -hmm. um dice discord (laughs) dice are not necessary you know you can yes they are they're so pretty i know but pretty dice it's hard to get dice these days um I found the loot goblin who likes the shiny clackety clacks. <laughs> yes, and then there's always the person who brings the metal dice to the glass table. Uh, oh, don't be that person, please. Yeah, if you have a metal dice set, congratulations. Please don't roll it on the glass table. Um, but yep. yeah, like on a complete minimalist level, you can go with um, Discord. Mm-hmm. Or there's hundreds and hundreds of rule sets that aren't licensed Dungeons and Dragons that are on what's called the open uh, open gaming license I think um, check those out because a lot of them are pretty much the same any realistically just about any d20 system is gonna play like Dungeons and Dragons yeah with with some variances um, but yeah like so pretty m- systems yeah so pretty much pick a system you know Obviously, Dungeons and Dragons is the most popular. And then, if you want to explore outside of that, there are other, you know, tabletop role playing games such as Pathfinder, Chronicles of Darkness, World of Darkness, Call of Cthulhu, and so many more <laughs> that you could literally just Google it, and there you go. You'll have a plethora of other, you know, systems that you can, can try out. Some you'll like, some you won't like, and some you know everything else in between um and then so you got your material you got your group of friends and then lastly is just throwing yourself out there and just having it i would i would say in closing tabletop gaming is a a skill Mm -hmm. and the only way that you begin a skill is to throw yourself at it and the only way you get good at it is to keep doing it there is there is no shortcut. Someone might naturally be able to do one part of it or another. I naturally have sort of a, a level of comfort being in the GM seat. I do voice imper- I do voice things all the time. I do noises. I do. Uh, uh, I don't know what the lip version of Foley is, where you're like making sound effects with your mouth, but I do that all the time. Oh, show us. Um, uh, well, like. <laughs> Well, no, no, no. Uh, one good example was when I was when I was doing live shows. Uh, I, d- I did take a little hint. Like, feel free to take hints of inspiration from Critical Role. I did because Matthew Mercer is very very particular in how he has weapons sound, and so I differentiated between the the sort of of a an arrow and the of a crossbow. Oh, okay. When when I was doing that, yeah, um, you you know you got to think about the crossbows a little more mechanical. Mm-hmm. Um, but I I caught the difference. I did. Yeah, I heard it. Don't worry. <laughs> so you know uh, stuff like that. I'll, I'll do monster noises, weapon sounds. Uh, you know, I try not to. I try not to push too far into accents because accents can easily become a crutch. Um, so I try to keep it light there just because, um, but things like speaking differently, uh, enunciating differently, really, really important when, when, uh, picking classes, but, uh, you know, someone might be more of a natural at one part or another, but I absolutely had to learn how to manage a table. That mm-hmm. was my skill was being able that I had to learn was being able to say, no, I'm the GM. I am the one who is the arbiter of the rules here. 
if there's because I had a really bad habit of stopping what we were doing and looking up a rule. Hmm. And you don't want to disrupt play as a GM. You make a ruling and you find and you you pick later. Oh, okay. Um so it's like, okay, I got that wrong. We'll get it next time. It's okay. Don't mm -hmm. don't stress out about it. And as you go, you'll get closer and closer and closer to where even if you can't remember a rule, you will get so close that it won't matter. Yeah. And then obviously that comes with time and experience, uh, trial and error. So if this is your first time DMing and you're great at it, awesome. And if you're not, it's okay. You know, it's a learning experience. So if you want to get better at DMing, you know, keep practicing and honing your skills, learn what you're good at and get better at what you're not good at. But again, if you're, if, if it's not for you, it's not for you, you know, just try to find somebody else that is good at it, you know, and that's the nice thing about uh, tabletop role playing is that everybody has a role, you know, and everybody is good at something, you know, and if it's your first group encounter, like if all of you are new at this, all of you guys are going to start learning just a little bit more about yourself and about your friends. <laughs> I, I would say that is one extra thing I want to tack on. Mm -hmm. If you are trying to find a GM, th this is important. If you are trying to find a GM, go on YouTube, whatever, look at D&D &D shows, find a, a fairly popular GM that you like. Bet you they have a Discord <laughs> with bunches and bunches of people and probably a GM who's looking for someone to experiment on some on some things with and if you don't mind being a little bit of a guinea pig you'll get a a gm pretty quick you know what at that point sometimes you're desperate enough you'll be a guinea pig <laughs> so yep and then obviously at the end of the day you're just a group of friends having fun making memories eating chips ordering pizza you know and just having a good time <laughs> mm. all right guys so again i'm melina I'm Ian Wyverian from the Domain Gaming, and we are joined by uh, Josh, a.k.a. Vincent Elwin. And we are two nerds and their pod. Bye, guys.